Okay. Hello, I'm Jennifer Law. For those who don't know me, I'm the president of the Center for Bioethics and Culture based in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I'm absolutely, um, I feel like a little fangirl here because I'm talking to somebody who I, I followed her, her writing for years. She's been so influential in, in my thinking and the work that I do in the area of assisted reproductive technologies. Um, so I'm here today with Jenna Correa who wrote a book in the 1980s. Well, she's written several books, but the, the book that caught my attention early on was her most famous, I'm on my second, second copy of it because the first one fell apart. The Mother Machine, Reproductive Technologies from Artificial Insemination to Artificial Wombs. So it's such a delight for me to be able to chat with you and meet you in person, Jenna, welcome. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer. It's it's a great pleasure for me to meet you and have a chance to chat with you. I I really admire your work. Oh, well. yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's 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 what we need. It's what we need. So yeah. we need younger women coming up too. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So and let me yeah. start by asking you just to talk a little bit about you, your work, your background, how you got how you got interested in this space. Yes, well, uh, I, I, uh, my background is in journalism. So uh, when I was young, uh, and the second wave of feminism emerged, I was not immediately in it. I was living in Greece, I came back, and the second wave had emerged. I got a job on a newspaper and I asked, and I was in the five college area of Amherst, uh, Mount Holyoke and all, all those colleges. So women's studies uh, departments were starting. So I asked my editor for a, um, I, I wanted a full page to explore women's studies and the, the women's movement in, in, the, in the Pioneer Valley. So anyway, through a mistake, I won't go into it, um, but through a big mistake, he thought I was asking for much more than I was asking for. And so I had, I had a page every other week to explore the issues that feminists were, were raising. Uh, so that was divinity coming down <laughs> giving me more room to explore this. And I did a series on um, women in medicine. That's what I called it. So I, uh, I locally, uh, I would take all the issues feminists were raising nationally and examine them in the city I was in. So, so I looked into uh, childbirth, contraceptive uh, research and use, uh, the way doctors treated uh, women, unnecessary surgery, unnecessary hysterectomies and other uh, surgeries, uh, the way women's, uh, when, when women brought issues to the doctors, they were often dismissed, it was all in their head and so forth. So I did a whole series on that. Uh, and then I saw that feminists were working on different areas of this whole huge issue and that it needed to be put together uh, because they were related. And um, this was not the kind of writing I love to do. <laughs> I wanted to do a different kind of writing, but I felt that I felt... Um, it needed to be done. I could do it with my journalistic skills, and so I should do it. So, I, I, after I left the newspaper, I got a contract to write a book on uh, women in medicine, which was called "The Hidden Malpractice: How American Medicine Mistreats Women." Uh, so, working as a journalist, and then um, the uh, the the first test tube baby was born, Louise Brown. And uh, so uh, Gloria Steinem was invited. The Smithsonian Institute was having what they, I think they thought it was a cute idea to have a gathering on Valentine's Day and talk about the test tube baby and so forth. 
But Robin Morgan, who did a million trillion things, including ed editing Sisterhood is Powerful, uh, said to Gloria, no, Jenna should do this. And said to me, she invited me to lunch and she said, you should do this because you've been doing all this work on women in, in uh, women's reproductive health and women and doctors and so forth. So you do, do this. She was talking about this thing at the Smithsonian. I should speak about test tube babies. I had done no research. She was just born. So um, Louise Brown was just born. So, um, so Gloria said, yes, you know, Robin, you know, just arrange this really sisterhood was powerful. And, um, and Robin said to me, you know, you should do a book on this because a book needs to be written on this and you've got the background to do this. So, um, and again, I wasn't thrilled with the idea of, I was not, uh, doing a lot of scientific, re I didn't love reading OBGYN journals. I did not enjoy that, uh, um, but it, it did make sense. And so as soon as a, a, a physicians were saying they were creating test tube babies out of their compassion for the suffering of infertile infer women, I knew from the get-go that was not true because I had been reading OBGYN journals. There was no trace of compassion for infertile women before they wanted to sell these technologies. In fact, there was a blaming of infertile women, you know, that they wouldn't, uh, there were theories propounded that they, uh, that women, these were women who could not accept their femininity. They could not accept their feminine role. And, and uh, that's why they were not having babies. There was no compassion in evidence. So um, at least I could start out knowing that was not true. Um, and then, then I began the research on it, but at least starting from that bedrock fact, this was not about compassion for the suffering of women. And so that was the beginning of the mother machine. Right. You've already written the other book, the previous book on, on, right. on women. Um, and I'm, I'm just curious about how long did it take you to research and write this book? Because I can't, when you look at all the ground that you cover in the book, and I really hope people will get a copy. I mean, that must have been a very big undertaking time-wise. Yes, the mother machine. Yes, correct. Yes, it was, it was five years and I worked all the time. I huh. worked all the time. This was, um, this was before computers. I got my first computer when I was doing the bibliography and I thought, oh, this is great. I don't have to retype the whole bibliography every time I add something to the C's. Uh, in this little list, but the book itself was written without a computer. So, and I was just kind of remembering this. <laughs> so I would type up notes from, again, all these journals and, um, and inter I did a lot of interviews and so typed lots and lots of notes and then I would go photocopy them. And then I would get down on the floor of my office with my scissors and I would cut up the notes into different piles. You know, they fit this chapter, or they should go in this chapter, and so forth. And I say I'm remembering that um, because I remember the horror I often felt in the process of clipping these notes and seeing how women were being spoken of uh, and what was emerging. So anyway, it sort of dawned on me on my knees on the floor, cutting up these notes and putting them into different piles. Yeah, and it's almost yeah. like imagining all the women that have been cut up. Well, <laughs> that, yeah, you know, that is, um, that is the big uh, theme of the reproductive technologies of 
cutting whole women up into bits and pieces until we are the raw material for this new industrial process of reproduction that men are in charge of. Um, so when you were researching and writing, were there a couple of either things that you uncovered and discovered that you were unaware of that was deeply troubling? Were there just sort of these broader themes? I mean, what was kind of jumping out at you because you had this massive amount of research? Right, right. Um, well, well, the thing that jumped out all the time was that women were being experimented upon because all of these things were experiments. And, oh, I can feel the rage rising in me again. They The cover was that this was therapy. So they used a language of medical therapy, which of course they were doing to ease the suffering of women, but it was experimentation. Uh, so you you would see that. And, and, and sometimes I remember reading some sections of the, journal articles I was reading aloud uh, to my husband who was an engineer. And he said, gee, that sounds like engineering. Uh, it, it, what you'd read in an engineering journal that anything a, a doctor could think up to do to a woman's body, he could do, he could do. And, and just call it therapy. And then some things would fail and they'd just go on. But women were paying for all of this. Women were paying for all, the, all of this. And there was an assumption that um, th they were being helped, that this was done for their benefit. But that was that was part of the big lie. So it was, they, go ahead. They were offered, no, they were offered such these big hopeful promises of that baby. Right. And probably informed consent was, not even an element of any of this experimentation that they were agreeing to have done on them. They probably didn't even know it was experimental. No, I'm no, no, they didn't because it was the the language used was a language of therapy. Also, one would think uh, in in a medical field that there would be sort of basic levels of honesty, uh, and there were not in these. So. Um, uh, uh, I worked with a colleague, Susan Ince, after The Mother Machine was published, we, we, did, uh, we did an investigation on the success rates of in vitro fertilization, because these clinics were saying, we have a 25% success rate, we have an 18.5% growth, yet they had never produced a test tube baby, but they could have a success rate of 20%, no babies, and they did that because of the way they defined success. And there was no one definition of what success was. Each clinic could make up its own definitions. Mm. And some, and I found this stuff out because I sent questionnaires to all these clinics, but also went back and interviewed the, the, the doctors, the people running these clinics, and they would tell on each other they would tell on the other guy, oh, you know what they do. Boom. And that's how we found out a lot of how these numbers were manipulated. So what were some of the examples of what they defined as a success rate? Was it an embryo was created or a positive pregnancy test? Or, I mean, because like you said, it wasn't live births. Right. It wasn't, it wasn't, no, it was not live birth. So uh, it was often um, pregnancies per laparoscopy. So the laparoscopy used to take the egg out, but pregnancy did not mean a birth. And often they were what's called chemical pregnancies, a slight elevation in the hormones present in pregnancy which uh, was not going to go on to develop, you know, the, 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 the hormone rate would go down, no pregnancy anymore, but that was a success. That was a success in their tabulation of these things. So there was real deception of women, women thinking that they had a decent chance of getting uh, a baby from this process, uh, which was not true. And yeah. Jenna? 40 years later, it's the same song and dance. Mm, right. It's not, it's not changed. 
that's sad. Yes, this is, yeah, it's very yeah. discouraging. And, and there's still that, that false cover, uh, hope, new hope for the infertile. That's still, that's still in play. Yeah. I mean, I had not, until you just told me now, I had not even thought about the fact that there was no compassion until there was a profitable technology to offer. And then, and then the sympathy was poured, poured on in, in layers and layers. So how was the book received? How well was it received? Um, it, it, well, it, in the United States, the reviews were really, really good. And that, um, and almost all the reviews said massively documented. So I knew that the techno docs who were doing this would want to come after me. And so I, 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 it, it was hard to come at me in terms of accuracy because I used their materials from their journals and I was quoting interviews with them. So it was, it was very hard for them to come, up, come after me. But while the, the, it was critically very well received, uh, it was not, uh, it, it was not really well, well read, well read in the United States. It was very different in other countries and particularly in Germany, which is really interesting because um, <clears throat> a lot of the German uh, women in the, in the feminist movement and, and German men as well, they had the history of Lebensborn in the Nazi time where, you know, using women as breeders and, and uh, so much, you know, so much resonates now in the use of, of women in systems of surrogacy. So, so, but Germans did not, they did not for a moment believe this stuff about the technologies being developed out of compassion for, for uh, infertile women. They called that the deck mantle, like the, um, the sugar coating on the, the pill. They dismissed it instantly. They thought Americans were so naive to accept that, but they did not. And they knew this was about eugenics and control over who would be allowed to be born. Uh, so it was, so in Germany, there was a big movement um, against these new reproductive technologies. And, and I did a lot of, for a while, I was doing three speaking tours a year uh, in Germany because there was huge interest. And in terms of surrogacy, systems of surrogacy, um, th when that was outlawed in Germany, everybody signed on to the outlawing of that. There were, there were, I can't think of one institution or group that was not on board about outlawing surrogacy. Yeah. It has not been th that way in the United States. Do you uh, have any insight? I mean, I have my own thoughts on that. Do you have any insights on why the European context is different than the US context? Um, well, I think again, some is the history of, uh, uh, of an attempt to control populations in Europe, which is really painful for Germans. And I, I remember who are the children of, uh, you know, their parents may have actually participated in these, in, in these things. But I remember one time I gave a speech in Vienna and after the speech, a woman came up to me crying. She was a physician. She said, could we go speak somewhere? So we found an empty room and went there to speak. She was just, she was just extremely upset and crying. And she said she had done research on the role of physicians in Nazi Germany. And what she said, when I put my research together with your research, with what you've just talked about, it, it she said, es is zum Heulen. It, it, it is, uh, it, it, it is to, to scream about or sob about. She was horrified at how those, those, those two 
those two phenomena came together. She was very frightened um, for, for women and for all human beings and for the control over control over who's born, which we so see in systems of surrogacy, you know, that men wanting to control that, you know, they want this woman whom they see as a receptacle uh, and they want to control what products she produces. Mm -hmm. So when you say what, you know, what horrified me as I was writing, um, that, uh, that, was, that was a big horror too to see this control over human beings. Now this is going on, this controlling what products are to be born to white women, middle-class women, you know, who are also victims, but those, the babies that they will come out with are more desired. Meanwhile, in Bangladesh and India and Africa, there's a big push um, there's no, there's no empathy for infertile women in Africa yeah. or Bangladesh. No, the point is to keep those women from procreating. So this is really, this is about controlling who can live on the earth. Yeah. Who, who procreates and who doesn't. Right. Wow. So I, I asked you, and maybe um, you can comment, why do you think it's, so bad in the U.S. Is it? Is it yeah. capitalism? Is it that we see doctors as service providers? Is it? Is it our entitled? We have this technology, therefore we have a right to use it. Where are the feminists in the U.S. that are out, outraged? Yeah, uh, you know, I can I can only hazard some guess. Sure. And one. Um, and one thing I do, I have seen even among feminists, they weren't feminists fully embracing this, you, you, the, you, an attempt to stop these new reproductive technologies. And one thing I heard from some feminists, even within the women's health movement, was sort of, you know, musing about this, that they could imagine themselves wanting to use donor eggs they could imagine themselves wanting to hire a woman as a surrogate. And suddenly then surrogacy became okay if it was if they could use it or using another woman's donor eggs was okay if they could, I might need it. So therefore, you know, so that was very, that was very disturbing. You know, some of the Europeans would, would just comment on our, political naivete, you know, not seeing into power structures and falling for, for the, the public relations lines. You know, there's been such a shaping of what is real. You know, we're, we're seeing that yeah. throughout the country now, but there were really, uh, there was a lot of effort put into shaping what reality was. And a lot of Americans fell for that. I, I did one speech in, in Germany um, called What the King Cannot See, just um, take, taking off from an essay that Marilyn Fry wrote about reality. And she, she spoke of reality as um, something from coming from the word real in Spanish, the of a pertaining to the king, to the royalty. So what was real, real, was whatever the king could see. That's reality. So I, I in my speech, I said, I'm interested in unreality. I'm interested in the experiences of women. You know, what, uh, what are women feeling, seeing, experiencing? Uh, and and so the speech, you know, just it, at first went down. This is what the king can see, um, and this is what the king cannot see. This is what women experience, and I I really would love to bring more unreality into the world, bring the experiences of women into visibility. They've been really shut out, um, and. Uh, and then, as I said, there's been this manipulation of 
a reality with the to to portray these new technologies as successful as helpful as benevolent mm -hmm. and to obscure the costs to women and to the babies who become products yeah yeah well, I, and I, how, how many editions has this book gone into the mother machine yeah i maybe um maybe three and it's come out in uh japan and england it's um and i think that's it it, it has not come out in france a lot of a lot of the speeches I've given have come out in other languages, but not yeah. the book itself. Yeah, it's it's really, a, I mean, it's still a popular book. It's hard to find, you know, whenever I, one of my copies wears out and I have to go find another one. The one right. I have is, an, is from an old library. It's been, you know, taken off the shelves of a library. Right. That's right. my copy. It still has the old check, check out card in the front of it. Oh, right, right. Maybe, maybe if I live it's... long enough, you know, I've asked my publisher to turn over the, turn the rights back to me and uh, still waiting on that. They said, nobody's, and this was during COVID, nobody's going into the office nowadays. No. But uh, if I, if I can find a way to uh, get that published again, I will. Yeah, because, you know, I would think of like Renata Klein and Susan Hawthorne, Spin Effects might be a great place to, you know, right. bring back the, the new and improved mother machine. And, yeah. and we can show how nothing has changed. I know. <laughs> it, it's gotten worse. <laughs> yeah, it, it has gotten worse. It yeah. has gotten worse. Because when I wrote that, that was at the beginning of this industry. And it has really expanded since then. Yeah. Uh, and, and surrogacy has certainly expanded since. Then. And you said in our email communication before we chatted today that, you know, you you did about three more years after this book came out, probably in touring and giving talks and keeping up on the research. Right. And then did you just say that said I've, I've made my contribution? I have other things I'm interested in or how did it how did you how did you go from five years and then three years of you know pushing out the message? Right. To sort of go go quiet on the topic well i had to earn a living so i uh, <laughs> had to pay the so bills i've never been i haven't been good at figuring that out so i then wrote another book which i could get a contract for i could not get a contract for another book on the technologies so i wrote on women and aids women in the aids epidemic um which was entering another nightmare you know you have to you have to touch everything in this society that is really difficult. So I wrote that. Uh, and uh, about that book? I'm curious, because as a nurse, I worked in the height of the AIDS epidemic in San Francisco. Uh -huh. So tell me, what was the, the thesis of that book, Women in AIDS? What was? Uh, well, it, it, it was how women are often seen as the vectors of the disease rather than people who themselves suffer from the disease. And it was studied in men and, and often, you know, presenting symptoms were different for women in, in some cases. And they were, they were seen as, you know, in terms of looking at women, they looked at, at women in prostitution because they were a danger to valuable people, um, i.e. men. And, um, so it, it was not studying the disease in women and not putting a spotlight on it and providing women uh, what they needed and a real blaming of women because many of the women um, acquired the virus through intravenous drug use. So there was a blaming of the women uh, as, as drug addicts. And no, always the focus is very, very narrow, narrow on the woman and what's wrong with her and not opening the lens wider and saying, uh, what is the pain women are attempting to numb uh, in using these drugs? Because there was so much um, sexual abuse that women had been subjected to, so much violence women had been subjected to. And that too was rendered invisible. Um, and so they were uh, just looked down upon and not uh, research not conducted on, on them and on what they needed.
Yeah. And when I, because I was doing pediatrics at the time of the oh, San Francisco, yeah. and we had the first baby that we saw um, HIV um, positive in the hospital. And unbeknownst to the mother of the baby, her husband was having extramarital yeah. affairs with men on the side. And she had no idea that she had right. contracted HIV from her husband, who then then they pass it on to this baby. So there was those instances too, where women were like, well, how did I get this disease? I don't use IV drugs, you know? Right, 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 right. Yeah, mm -hmm. interesting. And, and you know, it, at um, shortly after that book came out, the Pope came out with a statement that, that um, it was not acceptable to use condoms. I remember that. And uh, HIV. Uh, and you, so, uh, yeah, so w it, it was so difficult for women to protect themselves. Yeah, I uh, remember that. And I'm not Catholic, but I remember that because it was quite controversial because he basically made, I think it was um, Benedict was the Pope that made the yeah. same. He basically said that a married couple could either live together as brother and sister, you know, not engage in intercourse, but, or if they engaged in intercourse, they had to sort of roll the dice, gamble. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Talk about a, a difficult choice, a rock and a hard spot. Right, and as though women even have that choice. Yeah. You know, yes. that it totally omits sexual violence. Uh, yeah. You know, women are not making choices. So how well was that book received? I mean, that came out um, a very, a very provocative time in, in public health history. Right, right. So, um, uh, well, again, good reviews, um, uh, good reviews, but not a lot of attention. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. It was because the focus was more on men. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which is sort of a theme of mother machine. We, <laughs> I don't want to sound so bad, but you know, so. Tell me, you wanted to talk about what you're up to and interested in these days, because you're interested in something still in this, this thinking in your mind, but just very right. different. Yes, and it kind of circles, circles back to the earlier work. Um, I, I spent a long time um, working with men in prison, doing something called focusing which is a way of accessing the body's knowledge. And I, one of the things I did was um, work on creating like a first person science of criminology where the men looked at themselves to examine how they came to do certain things. And we did a series on violence against women by men who had committed violence against women. Um, men who had beaten women, raped women, killed women. And it was like being in uh, a consciousness raising group for oppressors. That's what it felt like. So that is, um, I, I guess I've never been able to explain this well, but let me see, let me see if I can do this. We were accessing the body, the knowledge of the body. And when I say body, most people don't know what I mean because they probably are thinking of what I thought of as the body uh, some time ago as this object. That's how we were treated. This body is an object, a thing in the world. But there's a very different way of experiencing the body or experiencing it from the inside and experiencing its connections to um, to everything, really. There's a way to access that knowledge. And it is um, counterintuitive. It means that the, the mind has a lot going on inside it. It's running around, but it's it's kind of it's kind of stuff we already know that's running around up there. When you drop into the body, and especially into the inside of the throat, the chest, and the belly, where all these neurotransmitters are, you're, you're reaching something that has not yet moved into the brain. So it is very new and fresh. Mm -hmm. 
and it's not readily there. There are some things that are readily there in the brain, but this is not readily there. You have to slow down to access it and you have to come in with a certain attitude or it, this information will not reveal itself. You have to come in with an attitude of compassion for whatever shows up in there and acceptance of whatever shows up in there. So when you do that, amazing things can happen. Think you, you make a request for all about the time I killed that woman. And it is going to put together, the body is going to put together very things that have never been put together and something new that you have never understood before will emerge. So uh, I, I spent quite some time with men working on that hmm. and really seeing them go through many, many changes in the course of this. Again, it's a different speed. It's not fast. You, you know, we first did the kind of focusing based writing on their violence against women with me prompting them with various um, forms of it. They begin writing and they be begin saying, I've never been violent to a woman uh, or they begin at one place. By the next week, things have shifted hmm. and new things have come up in them. Then we do more. We do speaking and people speaking of their experience. Week by week, things shift and it can be, it requires a lot of courage on the part of the people doing this to do it because painful things come up. Mm -hmm. But the reason I'm bringing this up is that I would love to go back and, and interview women more on our reproductive experiences with this slowed up um, form of interviewing uh, because I am sure there is more that will come out. I am sure there is more knowledge and wisdom that has not been touched yet mm -hmm. uh, because you have to do it in a way that, it, you know, this culture doesn't, slow, we have to slow down. Mm -hmm. We must have compassion for every everything that shows up. And then things begin to take a different shape. And then there, there are things that happen called felt shifts where suddenly um, uh, there's a freeing up of some stuck, something stuck in the person. And it's very visible and palpable. When someone is having a felt shift, you know it. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they may cry, they may laugh, they may sigh that, face may get brighter, but something, their way of being with a certain thing has shifted. Yeah. So when you think, because, you know, this is research, right? Sounds like you're a researcher. You've got this idea. You, you have this hypothesis. You, you think we can get women to slow down and you can take them through this writing, journaling, talking process. What are you thinking that you would find? What kind of themes? You know, like when we started our surrogacy research, you know, right. we thought we would find high risk pregnancies, high rates of cesarean section, right. postpartum, postpartum depression, low economic status, you know, all those kind of things. And, you know, and then we saw that it was proven. What, right. are you, what are you thinking that you'll see or find? I have to say, I really do not know, because that is the nature of this. This is information that has never before come to light. Mm -hmm. And each woman's body is a laboratory for what is a human being and she is going to come out with something new that we have not known before um that and it will be refreshing <laughs> it will yeah. be refreshing because something will come unstuck some yeah. some new way of being will come into the world with that and are you still doing this with with men are you still no, I've been right. I've been writing about it. I've just completed writing about that. And will and that be in a book or? I it, yes, it, I wrote it as a book. I have been uh, I, I I've, I've been having to get myself out of the Vermont woods, which is taking me a lot of time. So I haven't 
put attention into into finding a publisher, but I will do that. I'll, I I would I really want to bring that out, and um, and then I'm thinking, and it may not be fully me who does this. This is on my mind, but it may be that the this is very teachable. The way this way of doing it, um, women could learn to do this and interview each other in this way, slow things down and bring this out. So it could be, uh, many people could be involved in it. It doesn't need to be me doing everything. It doesn't need to be a trained professional or? Uh, no, th no, there, 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 are, there are wonderful skills in focusing that are really, really useful, but one can learn them, one can learn them. Mm -hmm. What do you do for fun? <laughs> uh, well, I love I love African dance. So uh, uh, and but I, I I have to say that since COVID, the classes here closed down. I haven't traveled to Africa, so I would like to get back to that. But I did that for many years, and uh, so I love that swimming, which I also haven't done because of COVID. But I am gonna. Uh, light out to Mexico for uh, for a time this winter. So I hope to swim, and uh, if I can dance, I will dance. Lovely, lovely. Well, is there anything else I didn't ask you, or we we're going to talk about that I forgot to talk about with you? Anything else you want to say? Any any words of encouragement you want to leave people with? Well, I think what encourages me is is that there are younger people coming out. So, and uh, I, I'm really heartened that there's a new book on the abolition of surrogate motherhood. And so that started, you know, women from France and, and, um, and uh, other countries, there's a new edition coming out in Italy. And I think there's one coming out in uh, Spain. So it's, it's really encouraging to me that there are younger women who are paying attention to this and, and writing wonderful, wonderful, incisive uh, articles on this and speaking on this. So I'm, I, that, that gives me a lot of hope. Yeah, yeah, good. And we can be thankful for, again, for Spinifex Press, because they're behind yes. publishing a lot of these books. Yes, the, yes. <laughs> yes, they really are. And I just want to say, um, I am also so awed by some of the women like Renata Klein, who has been working, 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 and like Janice Raymond, all their lives working in this very courageous uh, way for women. And I'm, I'm filled with gratitude for them. These are beautiful, beautiful lives. Um, and yeah, I, I feel a great debt to them. I agree. And the younger women will be able to stand on the shoulders of the great work that, that these women did, you know, earlier on, you know, so yeah, I, I share with you the gratitude of people who have just not given up and they're still, still in the game. Right. You know, right. You know. Well, it was lovely to chat with you. I, I, oh, I'm so thankful for taking the time. Yeah, it was a great pleasure talking with you, Jennifer. Yeah. Stay okay. more there in Vermont. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>